Well, good morning. Good to see everybody today. Do you have a Bible with you today? We're going to the book of Luke. The 15th division of Luke's great gospel is where we'll spend all of our time today. Luke chapter 15. Certainly good to see all of you. I want to join in the welcome that you see from Dan this morning. So glad that you're with us today. We have folks visiting with us from a variety of places, both from our community and from other parts of these United States. And we welcome all of you. Whatever brings you our way today, we welcome you. And we hope you can come and be with us again. It's great to look in this audience and see some folks who are with us today who've been out for a while. It's great to see uh, Molly Morris back with us today, and Sheila Cunningham is back after uh, being away and in the hospital up in Macon, and uh, just great to see all of you. I also want to tell you that uh, uh, early this morning, uh, Clay Soto's grandmother passed away. Uh, this Clay's mom, Gina, has visited with us an awful lot over the past few years, but uh, Dolores Hyde was her name. I knew Dolores and her husband, Leon, uh, who has taken such wonderful care of her for the past years uh, when I was in Texas, and they were just amazing, amazing people. Dolores has suffered horribly with Alzheimer's in her last years, and Leon has given her such wonderful and loving care. And she passed from this life this morning. We want you to know about that. Clay is here this morning, and I spoke with his mother just a little while ago. They're a wonderful family, so I'd like to ask you to be sure and speak their name when you pray today, if you will. So good to see all of you. I'm glad to be back with you today. I was, uh, I was in Indiana last week up in Indianapolis and uh, uh, had a wonderful reminder. I had a wonderful gospel meeting there last week and had a wonderful reminder about why I live in Florida last week as well. Uh, Tuesday morning, it was eight degrees uh, with a six below zero wind chill and snow. And why people choose to live in that place, I have no earthly idea. <clears throat> so uh, I came back, and uh, this, this, t this morning feels balmy after that, I'll tell you. Absolutely. I'm glad to get to be with you this morning. Hope you have a Bible. We're going to read together in just a second. You know, I've taught adult Bible classes for four decades of my life now, and one of the things that oftentimes adults will say is, after a class, they'll come and they'll have a question, and they'll say, you know what, I wanted to ask this in class, but I really didn't want to ask it in front of everyone. And so then they'll ask the question. It's interesting, little, little kids in their classes, they don't have that problem. They'll ask anything. They don't care who hears. They don't care whether or not it's the right time to ask it. They just ask. Kids ask all kinds of questions, especially about God. Where did God come from? Has God ever been married? What does God look like? How old is God? Just all kinds of questions about God that probably all of us at some point in time have wondered about a little bit. What does God look like? You ever wondered about that one? Because I'll guarantee you when we pray to God, we have some kind of a mental image, don't we? And probably it has more to do with the influence of of art on us than more than, more than anything. But of course, we know that the Bible doesn't, doesn't tell us that. Uh, he doesn't, you know, God is a spirit. He is a spirit. And so we, we, we wonder about that. But we all probably try to picture God, at least in some way. In the New Testament, Jesus paints a picture of God for us. It's not with ink and it's not with pen, of course. He doesn't paint it on a canvas. He uses words. And the picture of God that Jesus gives us is unlike anything that had been seen before. Because he says that God is not like our God is not like the ancient gods of, uh, of Greek and Roman mythology. Those gods were often just men who were uh, given some special power, and often they behaved as very bad kind of men. But Jesus said, our Father is not like that at all. He's not just a new and improved version of a man at all. And so the picture that Jesus gives us of our God is in the form of a parable. And it's an ageless and timeless parable. It's a familiar story. It's so familiar that I'll guarantee you that 95% of this audience could fill in all the details. It is so, <clears throat> it's so real a story that, that virtually all of us can put names to individuals in the story, either from our own family or from those individuals that we love. And it's such a relatable story that oftentimes, because we can put names of those we love in the story, we fail to see that the story really is about God. There are certain stories in the Bible and phrases and illustrations in the Bible that when you hear just the first few words of a verse, you know immediately where it is and what it is about. And so if I say to you this morning, in the beginning, God, well, you know where that's at and you know what the next two chapters are going to be about and you know how that, how that relates to us. So here are the first words of this story, as Jesus told it. A certain man had two sons. 
So what story are we talking about? Well, you know the answer to that. What are the details of that story? Well, you know the answer to that. That's a story that you were taught when you were a little child and somebody loved you enough to take you into a Bible class. It's a story that you have told and maybe it's a story that you've lived in your own family somehow, some way. We know that story. We call that the parable of the prodigal son, but in reality, of course, the story is not so much about the prodigal, a bad young man who turned his life around, although that's an amazing story. It's really about the father, because without the father in this story, you don't really have a story. You don't have a story with purpose or meaning, at least. And really, the message here, the main thrust of the story is not about appreciating what you have, although that's certainly an important lesson to derive from it. It's not really about sibling rivalry or jealousy, although that's an important lesson to derive from it. It's not about finding yourself, although that may be an important lesson to derive from it. It's really a picture of God. In fact, in this story, Jesus allows us to look into the very heart of God as we try to see the image of our Father. It's a familiar story. Do you have your Bible this morning? Luke 15, verse 11. And so Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of my inheritance that falls to me. The father divided to him his livelihood. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that boy was in the far country a long time before he left home. He had that all worked out, and in his mind, he was already there. The only thing that wasn't there yet was his body. And so he found himself in the far country, and there he wasted his possessions with wasteful living. When he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land. He began to be in want. He went and joined himself to a citizen of the country. And that citizen sent him into his field to feed swine. He gladly would have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and yet no one gave him anything. When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and yet I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And the boy arose, and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, and he had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son, true to his word, by the way, said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm not worthy to be called your son. But the father interrupted him here and said to his servant, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let's eat and be merry. Because this my son was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began, they began to be merry. Well, that's a great story, familiar story. The prodigal, of course, goes to the far country and gets into trouble. There's a famine, money's gone, no food, no friends, no one to help. He goes to work for a pig farmer, a terrible place for a young Jewish boy. And even he will not even give him something to eat. He really cares more about his pigs than he does this young man. But at some point, he remembers his father. And he remembers that his father was different than everybody else that he knew in his life. He remembered that his dad was a good man, that he treated his servants well, and so maybe his dad would take him on just as a hired servant. Could I ask you this morning, how do you see God? In your mind's eye, when you think about your father, how you, how you see him will color your perception of the world. If you see God somewhat as a celestial traffic cop and he's ready to run radar on everybody and just immediately punish you as soon as you step out of line, that will color the way you feel about your God. If, on the other hand, you see God as kind of a sign of a celestial Mr. Rogers, where everybody's okay and you just love everybody and whatever you do, really, he's kind of like your grandpa. He'll pat you on the head and say, you know what, you probably shouldn't have done that, but it's okay. Boys will be boys, and I understand that. And so we're all just going to pretend that nothing ever bad happened there. Well, that'd color your view of God as well. But it's interesting that when Jesus describes him, and he says a certain man had two sons, in verse number 20, that man with one boy, in verse 20, he rose and came to his father, and while he was still a great way off, his father had compassion on him saw him, ran to him. 
He saw him when he was a great way off. Have you ever wondered about that? He's a great way off, so how do you know that it was his boy? Well, because parents know those things. Now, I guarantee you, every parent in this audience can walk in the back of this auditorium, and if they've got a child sitting down, they can look in the back of the heads, and they can immediately pick out their child. That's not hard to do. And every parent knows the gait of their child's walk, and we all have a certain way that we walk. And every parent knows that. They know that about their children, every single one of their children. And every parent knows the sound of a child's voice. And every parent, if they are in a, their child is in a crowd and a lot of people are talking, they can pick out their, their child. But I tell you, even more than that, I believe the father had been longing for this day. He'd been praying for this day. You have to know that he was always hoping, always praying, always looking, because this father, at least as Jesus will tell the story, believed that one day, one day his boy would come home. And he did. And it's interesting that when the boy comes home, when the boy comes home, the father knows exactly, the father knows exactly the situation that he's in. He said, this son of mine was dead. And the reason for that is because sin always gives you a paycheck. I mean, that's what Paul said, Romans 6 and 23, that the wages, the payment, pay at the end of the day for sin is death. And so he said, my boy was dead. He was dead to common sense. He was dead to godly counsel. He was dead to how blessed he had been. He was dead to how good he had things at home. And he was lost. My boy was lost. He didn't know where he was. He didn't know where he was going. He didn't see what he was doing. He didn't see where he would wind up. He didn't see the consequences of the behavior. He did not see the trouble that he had caused his family. He was lost. The boy had made a fool of himself in so many ways. He wasted all his money, the text says. Whose money was that, by the way? Well, technically, I guess we could say maybe it was his because his father gave it to him. It was his portion of the inheritance. But, you know, the father had made that money. Probably took him a lifetime to accumulate it. And now there's nothing to show for it. There's no property been purchased. There's no house been built. No investments have been made. There's no estate. There's no livestock. There's just nothing. And so this boy ends up dead and lost. He is homeless and helpless, and hopeless. And yet the text says that when the father saw him, he felt compassion for his boy. Compassion's an interesting word. Our English equivalent for compassion is the word empathy. Nine times in the text in the New Testament it's said about Jesus that he looked upon someone and he had compassion on them simply meaning that he empathized with them, that God in the flesh was able, as empathy suggests, to put himself in the position of this individual who was fully human. It's an amazing thing that Jesus was able to do that, that he was willing to do that. Our world often isn't like that. Remember the old joke about the, the little boy who asked his dad, and he says, Dad, can you tell me what, what, what apathy and <clears throat> indifference means, and the dad says, I don't know and I don't care. Well, that's kind of the world in which we live. And that's the way it was in Jesus' world as well, and yet he tried to rise above that. And so nine times, nine times, it said that he looked upon an individual with compassion. And when he tells this story about that's representing our Father God, and he, and he puts him in the person of this dad whose boy has wasted what he has worked his lifetime to be able to provide for his family. He says this dad felt compassion for his boy. He felt compassion because this was his child. Even though the child left, even though the child had ruined his life, even though the child didn't deserve it. That's the way God feels about us as his children. I think God probably feels about us like we do about ours. You know, you can, say, you can say something mean and nasty about me. That's all right. You can say, you know what, Don? You were the ugliest person who ever lived. Well, you're probably right about that. I mean, I, but you say something mean and nasty about my kids. And I'm going to tell you, the mama bear, papa bear that's in all of us is going to come out about that. And God Almighty sees his boy, and he says, my boy was dead and lost. And he had compassion for him. Just like Romans 5 and 8 
God loved us when we were still sinners. And it says that he did something that people didn't do in that day. He ran to his son. Now, we see people run all the time, right? Yesterday in Temple Terrace, if you were out driving, you probably had to stop and wait because it was the trot through the terrace yesterday, and so these people were, were running. Some of them obviously had never run a step before in their life, and so it took a little while, but people were running. We, we see that. We don't think anything about it because people run in our culture, but people didn't run in Jesus' day. And in particular, patriarchs of families did not run, and yet this man runs. He doesn't wait for his boy to come back to him. He doesn't just sit back and watch and say, we're going to see how this, how this plays out. He runs to it. And also implied in that, by the way, is that evidently the servants saw their master running and they decided, well, we better run too, because when he gives orders, the servants are there to hear the orders. So we got people running in the story. We're in a culture where people didn't run. And then he embraced his son. And I got to tell you, that would have been something, because the the boy, the prodigal, was likely barefoot and dirty, and he probably smelled like pigs. You ever been around pigs? Pig smell. And my father-in-law was the fire chief, one of the four fire chiefs in Clearwater, Florida, but when he retired, he moved to Tennessee and he bought a farm. I don't mean that he bought the farm and that he died there. I mean he literally bought a farm. And he raised cattle and he raised pigs. And when we would go to be with them, either at Thanksgiving or Christmas every year, and he had these four son-in-laws there, he believed that was a wonderful time for him to get work done with the cattle and pigs. And so he divided us up. <clears throat> I got the pigs. And my job was to wring the noses of the pigs. Anybody in this audience ever wring the nose of a pig? Okay. First, pigs don't like it when you do that they get angry. But one thing you realize pretty quickly is that pigs have an aroma that is all their own, and they share it with you. And so when this boy came home, he was dirty, and he smelled. But because the father cared more about the fact that he had been dead and lost and was alive and found, he embraced the boy because none of that mattered. And so he kissed his son. He didn't just put his hand out and say, son, good to see you. Decide to come home, did you? Well, your mom would probably be happy to see you. The ultimate sign of affection is that he hugged that boy and he kissed him. Because compassion really has to be seen and expressed in tangible ways. Now, I want you to notice the timing that all this happened before the boy said anything. Actually, in verse number 20, the boy arose and came to his father, but when he's still a great way off, the father saw him, and the father had compassion, and he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him, and the boy hadn't said anything yet. The boy didn't talk until verse 21. And so the father in the story didn't wait for the apology. I want you to notice that what Jesus is saying is that our God is quick to forgive, and our God is ready to restore. That's the kind of God we have. And did you notice what's missing here? That, that when the father opens his mouth, he doesn't give his boy a verbal beating. Boy, there's a lesson in that, ladies and gentlemen. And the lesson is that sometimes when our young people in particular, sometimes when our young people, when our young people sometimes go into the far country, as sometimes they will, and when they come to themselves and they decide that they want to come home, and they do come home, and they come home to their brothers and sisters in the family of God, and they come home to their Father, we've got to make sure that we don't hold them at arm's length, that we don't put them on spiritual probation, that we don't treat them like they're second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. Because I want to tell you, if we don't embrace those young people when they come back, the world will be more than happy to have them back. And Jesus said, this is our Father. And so the Father understands that the boy has changed. Because the core of rebellion is give me. Father, give me. I don't care really about you. I don't care certainly about my older brother. I, I just care about me. Give me. The core of brokenness is make me. Make me into something better. Make me a hired servant if that's where I need to begin. If that's what it will take, then let me just begin there. 
when the prodigal begins his <clears throat> apology, the father interrupts him. And he says, I want you to bring the robe. But he doesn't say any robe. He said, I want you to bring the best robe. Bring the best robe. Well, who's, who would own the best robe in the family? Well, the father would. And so in essence, he's saying, bring my robe and put it on my boy. It's an expression of comfort and acceptance because you don't just let anybody wear your robe. The father doesn't wait for him to bathe. He just, he says, bring my robe, bring the best robe and put it, put it on my boy and, and put shoes on his feet and a ring on his finger. Not just any ring, that would have been the signet ring, that would have been the family ring. That would have been the ring that said something. Because with a signet family ring, what could you do? You could purchase things with that. And so with the signet ring of a family, you could go to a merchant and you could make a deal for whatever it was, whatever product you needed, and you could take your signet ring and you could put it in wax and that seal was as good as giving money. And here was a boy that had wasted his dad's inheritance. And the father said, put the family signet ring on his hand. Because the father believed that he wasn't the same boy that he was when he left. He put shoes on his feet. Because slaves didn't wear shoes. Children in a family wore shoes. And bring the fattened calf. And that, would have been, that would have been an animal that would have been in a pen being fattened for a special occasion, maybe, maybe a wedding. But he says, we're going to celebrate here. And the point that Jesus is trying to make is that this is our Father. He's generous and kind. He's loving. He's forgiving. And so he says, if you want to know what, what God looks like, and see his grace. And hear Jesus say, you know what? The Father loves you more than you can even begin to comprehend. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And Jesus says, this, this is your Father. And, and this is the Father that, to whom we ought to be saying, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, the gift of his Son that that Rich told us about in the communion meditation this morning. And listen to Paul when he said in Ephesians 2 and 8, by grace you've been saved through faith. And it's not of yourselves, that is, it's not <clears throat> because you're so wonderful or because you've done some meritorious works or because you put God in your debt. It's the gift of God. Grace and salvation are the gift of an amazing God. Grace doesn't mean that God is going to look the other way at the wrongs and the sins that we have committed. Grace is not heaven's sunscreen. It's, it's, not, it's not saying that if, as long as I've got God's grace, nothing bad is, can ever come to me from God. He'll never punish me for my sins. That, that's not the point of that at all. Shall we continue in sin, Paul said, so that grace may abound? God forbid, he said. Grace is not pretending that nothing ever happened or that a change doesn't need to take place. but it's an acknowledgement of who our Father is and who we are. You know, Jesus prefaced this story by telling a story about, about lost sheep, and it's a nice story, and there's a great lesson to be learned there, but we don't really relate much to sheep. He tells a story about a lost, a lost ring, and we can relate to that a little bit because we've all lost things that were important to us, and we know what it is to search for them, and we, we can make an application there. But I want to tell you, when Jesus really wants to get our attention, here's the story that he tells. He tells about human relationship that is broken. And he, and he knows, he knows that we're smart enough to make the application to our standing before our Father in heaven. And so here we are. And how many times have we messed up? And how many mistakes have we made? How many sins have we committed? How many times have we wasted our opportunity? How many times... And we said to our Father, look, I know what you want me to do, but I'm going to go my own way anyway. And 
There's a passage in Ephesians 3 from which I have preached many, many times in this congregation. And I've preached all over the United States from this passage. Where, where Paul says, here's what I pray for you. I pray that you will be rooted and established in love, and you may have power together with all of God's holy people, because when God's holy people pray together and invoke the power of God, Ephesians 1 says the same power that God used when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead, great things can happen. And he says, I want you to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And I've made the application countless times that Paul, I think, is trying to say to us, look, we've all got to understand this is our Father. And the Father's love is wide enough to include everyone. Everyone. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you think about yourself. It doesn't matter whether you believe God has the capacity to love and forgive you and be compassionate toward you. God's love is wide enough to include everyone. And God's love is, is long enough to last every day. And I think Paul would say, look, I know some of you are going to have trouble believing that. Some of you stood by somebody in a facility, maybe like this, and you stood in front of your family and friends, and somebody promised you, I'm going to love you until one of us buries the other, and they did not. And Paul says, I want you to know your God is not like that. That's not your father. His love is long enough to last every day. And his love is high enough to cover anything. It doesn't matter what kind of a mess you've made of your life. It doesn't matter how many sins you've committed. It just doesn't matter. God's love is high enough to cover all of that. And Paul says God's love is deep enough to be everywhere. Sometimes people come in this building and I'll say to them, how are you doing today? And sometimes people will answer and they'll say, I'm doing pretty well under the circumstances. And I know what they mean by that. They mean that they are underneath something that is weighing down on them, that is pressing down on them, and they are under that. And Paul says, I want you to understand God's love is deep enough to be right there with you. And Jesus said, this is your father. This is your father. A father of amazing compassion and amazing grace and amazing love. It's wide enough to include even, even a child who rebelliously runs away and knows exactly what he is doing when he does it and does it with rebellion in his heart. But then he makes a U-turn and he comes back. And his love's long enough to last every day, high enough to cover whatever you've done and deep enough to be with you in your lowest moments. Jesus tells that story, and don't you know that he's wanting to say, don't you want a father like that? How could you resist, how could you reject a father like that? And that's what we would ask you. Meet your father. Jesus said, that's who your father and so today, ladies and gentlemen, if, if you need to come home to your father because you, you read that story, and as you read that story, you can put your name right there in the, in the boy that rebelled and walked away, and you can put your name right there because that's been you. Your father is scanning the horizon this morning, waiting for you to come back. And if you need to be born into the father's family today, be adopted as his child through the water of baptism, He's anxious for that as well. And so if there's a response you need to make to God today in a public way and we can help you, please let us. Let's stand. Let's sing.